Oh, man. Hey, you want to preach? Come on. <laughs> I would give anything to have your voice. I really would. I'm supposed to come up here in the darkness, so there's mystery. You know, as anticipation builds. But I came up with a bright light, so you got, you got to see my bald head and, you know, how I walk, whatever, anyway. I'm honored to be able to come and speak to you today. Normally, uh, well, I wouldn't say normally. Often, I'm on the screen that you see behind me and, and I broadcast it from, from another campus. But uh, I got a chance to be with you today, and they're watching me. Hey! Deep Creek Campus, hey out there. So here at West Portsmouth, and you, by the way, you guys have a wonderful crowd. I, I'm really impressed. I walked through the building, I saw many other people out there as well. When the virus is over, and it will be over someday, very soon, but, but you all are going to blow the doors off. You really are because uh, a lot of folks can't come now because of the virus. They're going to come back, and you're going to have even bigger crowds than this. So uh, it's, it's just good to be with you. It really is. We drove over in the rain. I was praying really hard. Please let there be no train today. <laughs> no train. Have you ever stopped at that train before? Oh, yes. It's like uh, 400 cars long, and you have to wait and wait and wait. And sometimes it stops. Yeah. It just stops and doesn't go anywhere for a longest period of time. I, I, I told uh, uh, the Deep Creek campus, hello again, Deep Creek. I told the Creek Camp this morning that if the train was coming through this morning, I'd probably preach from the car. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's wonderful to see you. It really is. Now, I'm looking with you at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3. You know, I'm speaking through Matthew's Gospel. But I'm also, this is one of those rare occasions where I'm going to read from another Gospel as well because the other Gospel gives commentary on what Matthew says so you can understand it better. So we're looking at both Matthew 3 and also John 3. It'll be on the screens for you so that if you don't want to turn back and forth in your Bibles, you don't have to. Here we are, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 11 through 14. And then John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. I'll be talking to you today about humility. I uh, spoke last week about John the Baptist being a man of integrity. Integrity means all of one piece. Maybe you watched The Mandalorian. You watched The Mandalorian? And uh, this season, uh, the, the ship was attacked, and they got a big hole in the side of the ship. And he said, the hull has lost its integrity. He actually said that. So now what, what that means is that, you know, integrity is all of one piece. When you have a hole inside of your ship, you're not in one piece any longer. So integrity means all of one piece. And out of integrity, you're, you're the kind of person that wherever you, you're touched, you're the same, you see. You're all of one piece. Comes humility. So humility is derived from integrity. I work really hard on this sermon on, on humility, and I'm really proud of that. <laughs> Let's begin reading now with, with the Matthew uh, chapter 3, verse 11. I baptize you, this is John now speaking, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, talk him out of it, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Now we look at John's Gospel, chapter 3. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out of the Judean countryside. We spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptized in Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put into prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. Let me stop for a moment. The, the Jewish theology was they baptized as well, but a person came from being a Gentile to become a Jew, and the baptism was part of that ceremony. They couldn't even imagine why a Jew would be baptized. And we don't have to go from being a Gentile to a Jew. But what John was saying was that the change you have to have in your life, when you really know what your sin is, is as great as going from being a Gentile to a Jew. So some Jewish leaders didn't like this, and they were trying to engage John's disciples in a debate about baptism. And along the way in that debate, 
we have to suppose, based on what, we, what was said here, that this, this uh, Jewish leader brought up Jesus and what he was doing. And so John's disciples said, oh, Jesus is baptizing too. They didn't know this. And then people going after Jesus in great numbers, they didn't know this. So let's, let's get back and read it again. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given to them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. Now verse 30 is one of the most powerful and meaningful verses of Scripture, but also one that tugs at the heart. He must become greater. I must become less. You need to know who you are. And John knew who he was. John knew his gifts. He knew his talents. He knew his abilities. He knew what God had called him to do. His humility was based on a, a correct understanding of what his mission, what his mission was all about. You see, John wasn't about himself. He was about Jesus. That was his integrity. Now, John could have been about himself. I mean, Jesus said he was the greatest man who was ever born. John had a tremendous ability to preach. He preached so well that people came out of the cities, we're told in earlier in the chapter, by the tens of thousands they hear him preach. And he had a very dramatic personality and appearance. That long train of flowing hair, the big bushy beard, the hairy coat, the belt around his waist, the strange meals he ate, remember? He ate locusts and wild honey. I mean, he had everything a good televangelist has. <laughs> and, and so with, with his, his ability, with his preachy voice, with his, his dramatic appearance, uh, people were just drawn to him. So, so John had all this going for him, but he knew who he was. And what he was about and who he was was not about himself. It was about Jesus. Now, where you are, you may think you're the guy and gal around which everything revolves. In your family, it's all about you. With your marriage, it's all about you and what you want. Maybe in your job, you think you're the, the boss of the office or the queen bee, wherever you are. Uh, you, you, on your street, people may think of you as uh, that so-and-so down the street, that everything's about that person, what they want, what they're like. It happens wherever you go, you leave a trail of broken bodies and broken spirits because you think you're the most important one. Well, you know, if you, that's what you think about yourself, you don't really know who you are. Let me tell you who you are. You are someone who's a sinner, and without Jesus, you're condemned. No matter what your gift, no matter what your talent, no matter what your ability, no matter how you look, no matter how handsome you are, that's a problem I've had to deal with over the years. But anyway... No matter how, how imposing and impressive you are, if you think you are really all that, if you think you're the center of everything, then you don't really understand who you are. I think the power of John was in his humility. He knew that all of his giftedness was not about himself. It was about Jesus and who Jesus was. Now, let me just say in passing, you talk about humility, how about Jesus? He comes down to the water be baptized by John. Now again, because John knew who he was, he didn't want to do it. He knew that Jesus should be baptizing him, but Jesus wanted to be baptized. And here's the reason why. Jesus came as one of the people. He, he wanted to do what the people did. He was going to die for their sins and lead them spiritually. And I'm talking now to, to leaders, and all of us lead someplace. All of us do. Leaders always lead as one of the people. You don't lead above the people, you lead as one of the people. You're down where the people are, and you should never ask, hey, politicians, are you listening to me? <laughs> maybe you're reading the news, maybe you're not, I don't know. But, but it, you should never ask your people to do something that you don't do yourself. 
because you're not better than the people that you lead. Jesus came down to be baptized because, well, we wonder about this. Why was Jesus, he didn't need to be repent. He didn't need to change. Why would he do this? Because he was one of the people. He wanted to do what the people did. Out of our Lord's humility, he was baptized. And out of John's humility, he didn't want to do it because John knew who he was. He knew his position. I want to tell you two golf stories. You don't have to appreciate golf the, the, like these stories, okay? You don't have to understand golf at all, okay? But uh, me and, and Cal and Sterling were uh, getting ready to play golf at Oak Trail, which is part of the Disney complex down in Florida. Oak Trail is a walking course. It's a very nice little course. It's not easy. It's tough. But it's a, nevertheless, it's designed to be a walking course. Sterling's been playing golf about three years now. And she's made a lot of progress. Started out like 125, and now she's breaking 100, which is really good. And you also know she's, she's expecting, she's pregnant. And I've been kidding her that her golf swing is going to change. It's going to go like this. <laughs> so we, we, we're getting ready to tee off, and we're warming up. And the, the practice tee is right next to the first tee at Oak Trail. So we're warming up. We got a big bucket of balls. We split them up. And I'll just give you a little golf tip. I told you this wasn't about golf. I'm going to give you a tip anyway. It, when, you, when, you, when you warm up before you play, don't practice because you don't want to have any negative thoughts in your mind before you go out on the tee. Just warm up. So I, me personally, I hit two balls with every other club so that I'm just loosened up. So we're doing it, we're hitting two balls with every other club. And there's a guy on the other side of the tee, he's about 50 yards away, he's a middle-aged guy, maybe late middle age, and he sees us over there warming up. And for some reason, he thought that he should come over and help Sterling. Now her husband is standing right here. <laughs> And her, her father-in-law is standing right here. And he walks 50 yards across the tee and begins to give Sterling tips. He's even trying to get his hands on her grip and show her how to hold the club different. What kind of chutzpah do you need to have to come across the tee 50 yards and start telling a stranger how to play golf? And I had seen him warm up. And I'm thinking to myself from Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, physician, heal yourself. <laughs> And it was giving Sterling the willies. It really bothered her. This guy that she did not know come up and giving her tips like this. Well, you see, you know, there's some people who think that they have, it, have everything. They have it all. They know everything. They could help anybody, even though maybe he needed help himself. He was trying to help Sterling. Let me tell you another story. We were playing golf last summer at Cal and Sterling. And I, listen, I love playing golf with my family. When Josh can join us, with all four of us together, and Debbie almost always comes along, and she's with us too. It just, it, just, it, just, it just means so much to me to be able to do this. So today it was Cal and Sterling and me. Debbie was in the cart. And we're on the fourth tee at Sleepy Hall getting ready to tee off. I look down the third fairway, and here comes two guys in a cart. And they're, they're playing speed golf. So they, they get out of the cart, they both hit at the same time, they jump back in the cart, go up to the green, they hit one putt, pick the ball up, and go up to the next tee. So this, they, they, they caught it to us, to us really quickly. So they come up to, to the fourth tee, and the guy gets out of the car, he's in his late 20s, early 30s, looks at me and goes, hey, old timer, are these two taking it easy on you? <laughs> I didn't know I looked that old, you know? So I looked at him and I said, Well, Sonny, I'd bite your head off, but I left my teeth at home. <laughs> oh, well. That, you, so I got a little upset. I challenged him. I drove his car home. <laughs> Just kidding about that part. What kind of person walk, drives up to somebody they never met before and calls him an old timer? Who would do that? Oh, but let me just stop for a moment. Stone, does this happen? This happen? Okay. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. You know, I got a witness here. <laughs> let me tell you who does that. Let me tell you who walks up with somebody on a tee and starts giving them lessons. Somebody who doesn't really know who they are. They've become arrogant and conceited and self-centered and thinks that the world revolves around themselves and they have the right to judge everybody else. It's the very opposite of the kind of humility that John the Baptist had. Oh, well, let me just say, John the Baptist's preaching was powerful. Not because he was preaching judgment and repentance, 
because, but because the people knew that he was living what he was preaching. He was humble. Now, let me just use the words of Scripture from John's Gospel. You can only receive what heaven's given you. And by the way, heaven there, forgive me for using a big word, is, is what's called a circumlocution by scholars. Circumlocution means you go around the actual word. They couldn't say God. It was, they had to respect God. So what they really mean when they say heaven is, is to go around God's name and use heaven instead. What, what, he, what he really means is you can only receive what God gives you. You don't have the place of service and ministry, the gifting and talents that God wants you to have. And I want you to hear this. Every single one of us has a gift, a talent, a place to serve, something to do for the kingdom of God. All of us do. Now, John knew who he was, and he knew what his place was. He had lots of gifting, but he knew what that gifting was all about. And you may think that the world's a real big machine, well, let me say it differently. You may think the church is a real big machine. I mean, how can you make a difference in this big machine? There's a big difference between humility and insecurity. A person's insecure just doesn't see how they could possibly, who they are, fit into what's going on. A person of humility knows that even though you may be a small person with a small little gift, all of us have small gifts. And even though the machine may be really big with lots of cogs, you're still a cog. You're still a gear. And that machine cannot work. That machine cannot operate without you being where you are using your gift, your talent, your ability. And heaven's given you. God's given you a place to serve. And you will find contentment and peace when you're in that place doing what God has called you to do. Now, this is not a, a time for me to teach you about how to find out what your gift is, what your talent is, where you're supposed to serve. In fact, I'm not like that guy on the tee with Sterling. I can't tell you what your gift, your talent, your place of serving is. I may be able, other teachers may be able to help you have the tools and skills to be able to do that, but that's up to you. You have to desire, want, to find that place where God wants you. You have to seek it out and get in that place and begin to use whatever God's given you. But let me say that you can only receive what God has given you, and he's given you something. Now, for me and my wife, you know, um, uh, I'm just telling you the truth, I'll tell you what actually happened. It's my testimony. When we came to uh, Deep Creek Baptist Church 30 years ago, before, that's a long time, isn't it? <laughs> we came 30 years ago, and we, we, we were going for our selection committee interview. You know, the selection committee interviews, you know, ask you all the questions. We parked across the street in the old school, which is now closed. It's still, the building's there, but it's closed. And Debbie and I held hands, we prayed, Father, if you want us here, we'll stay the rest of our lives. If, if we are effective, we'll stay the rest of our lives. We met that prayer, and we have. It's, for us, for, for, for me and Debbie, this has been the work of our life. And, you know, for a long time, churches would call for occasion and say, well, are you interested? We'd like to talk to you. And I would always say no, because that's not where God wanted me to be. They don't call anymore. They don't want a broken down old preacher, you know, so they don't call anymore. But they used to call. <laughs> but, that, that, but I was where God wanted me to be. I was doing what God wanted me to do. So I had received from, from God where he wanted me to be, and I was working in that place. And even though sometimes it was difficult, sometimes I was trying, sometimes I was insecure, and I didn't know what to do, I was where God wanted me to be. John said, I can only do what God has given me from heaven. Now his disciples, they had been involved in this debate with some Jewish leader, and they came back, and he said, Jesus is baptizing more than you. He's preaching to more than you, although it's added it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples. Jesus is becoming more successful. He's becoming more popular than you, John. Doesn't this bother you? Let me tell you who it was bothering. It was bothering his disciples. I mean, why did the Jewish leadership, the Pharisees and Sadducees, hate Jesus so much? Because he threatened their position. They were going to lose it to Jesus. Why did Pilate, this politician, even though he knew Jesus was innocent, why did he convict him and send him to the cross? 
because the crowds were yelling and he was thinking as they were yelling the, the curses they were yelling that the emperor was going to take him from his position they were afraid of losing their position it wasn't about where they were being where God wanted them to be it was about their position that they had achieved it was about their arrogance and so John's disciples, they were worried about themselves. But John wasn't worried because he was where he was supposed to be. He said, listen, my job was this. I was to point him out. I was to prepare the way for him. I was to preach about his coming. I was to talk about repentance so you get yourself ready. I did all the things I was supposed to do so that when he came, the way would be cleared. And he would say in John's gospel, as Jesus came, he'd say, there he is. The one I've been talking about, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John was contented because he was where God wanted him to be, doing what God wanted him to do. It wasn't for him about power or position or authority. Remember we talked about this last week, about money. It was only about doing what God gave him to do. Now, the people at uh, other campus know this because I've, I think four or five times over the years I've, I've talked about this song, but there's a song that means a lot to me. It's a Shaker hymn. Now, the Shakers, back in the 19th century, they did this. You know, they were the Quakers and the Shakers, you know. The Quakers quaked and the Shakers shook. <laughs> in, the, in the worship services. So, uh, uh, Shakers... The last one, last Shaker died like 15, 20 years ago. Shakers uh, didn't believe in evangelism and they didn't believe in marriage. They were celibate. And this is not a recipe for church growth. <laughs> so there was kind of a finite number of Shakers. They had extensive properties all through Pennsylvania, up through New England. And now most of them are museums that have been turned over to the state because there's no Shakers left. Nevertheless, they had this, this song, this, this American tune that they wrote a hymn to that's become very popular in American life. I know uh, Aaron Copeland uh, wrote a piece for a ballet called Appalachian Spring, and it's a very prominent part of Appalachian Spring. And the tune is like this. I'll sing it to you. I won't sing the whole thing to you because I don't want you to leave. <laughs> tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free. Tis a gift to come down where you ought to be. I want to stop, okay? Stop while you all can still take it. Let me just recite it for you. Tis a gift to be simple. Tis a gift to be free. Tis a gift to come down where you ought to be. And when you find yourself in the place just right, you'll be in the land of love and delight. Now what the hymn's about is this, that, that it's a wonderful life to be simple, to be free, to not be held down by this desire to achieve and to, to earn and to rise to a position, but instead to find yourself in the place that God wants you to be. And when you're in that place where God wants you to be, no matter how small you think that place is, you're in paradise. That's what John discovered. He could even go to prison and be beheaded and be content because he's where he knew God wanted him to be. So this is what our text teaches, that you should have the same attitude as John, who said, he must increase, I must decrease. I must decrease. He must increase. And you can say that about yourself. I'm in the place where God wants me to be, doing the thing God wants me to do, and it's not about me. So what I want to have happen is it becomes less and less about me and my gifting, my talent, my ability, who I am, what people's tensions paid to me. Instead, I want to decrease. And I want more and more and more for Jesus to increase, for it to be about him, for him to be held up so he could be glorified. So here's this gifted man. Here is this man. Jo Jesus called him, remember, the greatest man ever born. And the greatest man who, who was ever born said, I want to decrease. I want it to be about him. Now you, my disciples, you're, you're threatened. I'm not threatened. 
You're worried about yourself. I'm not worried about myself. I know that I am doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. And what, I, what I'm supposed to do is point to him so that his ministry can grow and increase so that he can be the savior of the world. And one day, no one will even remember me. He was wrong about that. You know. I want to decrease. I want him to increase. Now, what happens is that our relationships are broken, our marriages are troubled, our friendships are strained, we have difficulty at work, difficulty with our friends, and we, 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 we think that, that it's, it's everybody else. It's my wife, it's my husband, it's my kids, it's my, my ugly, horrible boss, it's those nincompoops I'm working with. It's those guys down the street and how they treat me. And we never think that the center of all those things, that all of them have in common is you, who you are. Let me tell you a joke. You wanted me to tell one, didn't you? You wanted me to. So uh, Bubba, you know Bubba, don't you? Lives down in Sunbury. You know Bubba, right? Listen, you, know, you know what Sunbury is? You, know what Sun you ever been to Sunbury? I have. I didn't even know I was there. <laughs> so Bubba, you know, lives in Sunbury, and his friend Billy came over, and Billy said, Bubba, what happened to you? Both of Bubba's ears are really badly burnt, blisters and everything. And Bubba says, well, I was ironing my clothes last night, and, and Bubba Jr. called, and I answered the phone and picked up the iron instead. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. What happened to the other ear? Well, he called back. Now, I'm not going to say that Bubba's stupid, okay? I'm not, I wonder, I, but he's certainly uh, a trifle ignorant. <laughs> and he makes the same mistake twice in a row. And, you know, there are people who are making the same mistake over and over and over and over and over again, and they keep wondering why their ears are getting burned. Perhaps what could happen in your life is that you begin to see that the commonality to every problem you have is you. And it's your behavior and your actions and your thoughts and the how you're treating other people that are causing the problem because you you want to be the center. You, you know, we had a we had a politician recently, uh, you may have remembered this, a president who was had a really big personality. You may remember this. You don't remember it. So how quickly will you forget? <laughs> he kind of reminded me sometimes of Teddy Roosevelt. They said of Teddy Roosevelt that Teddy wanted to be the baby at every christening, the bride at every wedding, and the corpse at every funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's how you are, you know. Wherever you are in every situation, you want to be the center, even in your relationship with God. And things can change for you when you start seeing that humility is a quality that you want. That you want to have your life decrease and God increase. And by the way, you apply that on a small level other people. I want to decrease. I want you to increase. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm praying now that we will learn the humility of John the Baptist. His integrity led him to be a person who was humble. He knew who he was. He received the gifting and the place of service you wanted him to have. And you made it so as you worked in his life that he could say, he must increase, I must decrease. I pray all of us can have that spirit so that our relationships, even with you, can be changed. Father, there might be somebody here at the Deep Creek campus who wants to believe in Jesus. I pray that they'll pray this prayer with me. Father, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I've broken your laws and commands. And I pray that you'll forgive me based on what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross 
You'll come and live inside of me by the power of the Holy Spirit that I might know that I have a relationship with you. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer with me, let me know on the card that you have in the chair. Let me know through talking to one of my online counselors. They'll pass the information along and we'll share with you more about what it means to be a believer. I pray this now, Father. In Jesus' name. Yes, we pray we can be humbled. In Jesus' name, amen.